I'm Peter Rice. I am um, a commercial loan officer, a commercial and team leader with TD Bank North in Hyannis. And um, the presentation that I'm going to do today is um, is really based on, uh, I've been doing commercial lending for about 20 years. And so I'm, what I put together in this presentation, which I did, uh, I did the same presentation here last year, and um, it's really based on putting together information about cash flow and understanding cash flow as a result of um, problems that I've observed people get into over the years, contractors, landscapers. Um, can, can I ask which, uh, since there's only two, yeah. one, two of you, um, you know, what, what your business is? Home repair business. Home repair, okay. Like remodeling and sort of renovations, and, okay. GC, custom homes, like commercial. Okay, All right. So, um, you know, a lot of the, the things that I tried to put in here are really based on just, uh, I guess, shortcomings, problems, um, issues that people ran into, things that they didn't understand that would have been helpful if they did understand. And um, so I, I put together um, something that tries to cover um, some of that. Um, we're just going to go over sort of three general areas, un kind of understanding cash flow, getting into just understanding basic concepts and a little terminology, um, then talking about planning and projecting your cash flow, and then lastly, just talking about some practical solutions. Um, understanding cash flow, you know, obviously, uh, maybe, maybe not obviously, um, you know, sales, profit, cash flow, all, all different things. You can, you can sell something, um, it does not necessarily result in cash flow until you actually collect it. Um, and, and growing businesses, something people often don't realize, businesses that are growing, um, are assumed to be sort of generating lots of cash until somebody gets into it and they realize as they're trying to grow the business, it really uses up a lot more cash than it generates early on and, um, and oftentimes people will run into trouble as a result of doing that. Obviously, keep cash flow keeps your business alive. It's you know, sort of referred to as the life's blood of, of business. Um, you can't have, can't have too much of it um, and if you don't have enough, it's gonna be a, a big problem. Um, you know, Profit and, and sales that are generated are really tied together by, by cash flow when you actually collect cash and when you have to use it to, to buy um, things that you need and the services that you um, have to obtain. Um, you know, ca um, cash flow versus profit, you know, just sort of the where the rubber meets the road kind of example. You can you can buy groceries and pay bills and and pay down debt with cash, but, but profit alone, if it isn't cash profit, um, you can't. That will look nice on paper and your accountant will tell you that you made a lot of money, but if you haven't collected the cash, it doesn't mean an awful lot to you and you can certainly um, go broke. As I was saying, companies that are growing rapidly can, can generate a lot of sales sometimes and even profit on paper, but, but still go broke because they didn't um, collect the cash. Um, profit being an accounting concept as opposed to as opposed to uh, real cash. Um, this is just a real simple example of, um, of sales over the course of a year. We're just showing, in this case, cash sales, meaning you have a sale or you have revenues that you're actually receiving cash um, right away as opposed to doing something on credit. You have cash expenses and then you have a profit that results. Now, if it's cash sales and cash expenses, then your cash flow is going to be the same because you know you're collecting. It's all real time. You're collecting it in cash and you're paying it out in cash, and you um, and you have a cash flow that results from that. No no difference between the two. But if you if you looked at a little different situation, and this is over a um, kind of a short period of time, less than a month, if you have some of your some of your selling going on in in cash, where you're really collecting cash at the time, and some of it you're doing on, on credit, where you're having to um, lay out funds, but you're not collecting cash uh, for what you're selling, uh, you can run into a problem. So in this case, you have, between the two, cash and credit sales, you have $40,000 of sales. Cash being laid out is 35000 for expenses, leading, leading to a $5,000 profit, but cash flow is negative 15000 because you haven't collected those credit sales yet if you're selling on, let's say, 30-day terms. You're expecting to be paid and asking to be paid 30 days after the sale gets made. You don't have that yet. 
Week two, same kind of situation. You're, you're spending, you have cash sales, that's fine, but you look at your cash expenses, they exceed the cash sales by, by 25,000 in that case. And so by the end of that second week, now, that, now that's another 25, so between the two weeks, you're now out $40,000 that you haven't collected in cash yet. That has to come out of your pocket at that point. Third week, same situation, another 50,000. And by the time you're done, you're still not at the end of that 30-day collection period yet. You, you haven't collected anything on those on those credit sales, and so you, your your cash position is negative 90,000, which means you had to come up with that from someplace, either out of pocket, borrowing, or some other ways that we'll um, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, you know, sources of cash. You know, some people might say, "Well, cash is cash." What, what, what do you mean, sources of cash? Um, obviously, cash. Sales is the most fundamental, obvious source of cash. Um, but deposits and, and progress payments that you get from from customers that may be, you know, in, in advance to allow you to, to purchase materials. That's that's an important source. Um, and these things, incidentally, are going to lead to something we talk about later as you do sort of do some planning. Um, collection of accounts receivables. You know, getting back to what we talked about on the prior screen, where you sell sell something for credit, essentially and you're not collecting it right away, but at some point later, you do collect it, that's a source of cash. Um, of course, existing cash that you have on hand to start with is a source of cash for you to use for your um, working capital. And then, of course, suppliers. You know, if you if you were standing in Tony Shepley's building, so let's use Tony as an example, if you go to, to, to Shepley and, um, and have an account and they deliver some lumber, now you have lumber that you've received on credit that's essentially a source of cash for you because you've been able to get those materials without actually pulling cash out of pocket yet. Um, and then, of course, loans, whether it's from a bank or um, from yourself. You know, if you, if you have an incorporated business and you pull it out of your own pocket personally and put it into the business, um, or, or family uh, loans, uh, et cetera, all, all important sources of cash. And then, you know, where does, where does the money go? Obviously, you get to pay labor and various overhead. Um, some of which is sort of fixed monthly stuff that you just have to pay over and over. It's always the same. Some of it's, you know, variable expenses based on the job that you're on and um, and specific costs that sort of expand and contract depending on what you're working on at the time. Um, um, inventory and, and materials, another big use of cash. Paying, paying loans, interest and principal on the loans. Um, paying down accounts payable. And then um, so-called shrinkage, which really means sort of loss or theft. Um, of your inventory. Uh, planning and projecting cash flow. So this is, um, just wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, when somebody is sort of thinking about these issues of, of cash flow, well, okay, so how do, you, how do you really project out? And it's not, um, certainly not rocket science, but it, it does require some thought and some you know, ability of, to, to know a little bit what you're going to have in the works, obviously, um, taking into account things that you've contracted for, and, um, and figuring out the timing of all of that, so that you can you can figure out without having a crystal ball to some degree what your cash flow needs are going to be as you go along, and most importantly, where might you run into some shortfalls where you have you have needs for cash because maybe hopefully you're busy enough that you need it, but maybe you don't have the cash on hand or have it coming in quickly enough to. Uh, pay for things immediately. So the, the planning process is obviously um, very important. So just going through, so what is the process? Um, and, and on the next page, there'll be a sort of an example we'll go through. But um, you know, starting with just what you have on hand for cash to begin with. Um, and then coming up with what your cash income is likely to be, whether it's from uh, sales that you're going to be expecting to get where you collect them at the time, or whether it's because of sales that you had Two months ago, and you know somebody that you're doing business with said, "You know, I'm going to get you that check on on Tuesday, so you expect to have that coming in." Um, then, of course, cash disbursements, things that you know you have to pay out. Again, fixed expenses, you know, the, the, the monthly truck payment, um, uh, payment on on piece of equipment, um, and so forth. Um, hi, certainly. Oh, yeah, okay. You can you can sign in if you want. Sure. Just grab a grab a seat, and uh, well, you catch right up. Excuse me, one second. Uh, 
Um, so um, going through that the, the cash flow planning process, adding the cash that you started with on hand plus your cash receipts, and then subtracting out your your projected cash disbursements gives you what you're left with on a monthly basis. And uh, as it says, hopefully positive number. So so here's just a, a very you know sort of overly simplified example. You know, beginning of May, you start with five four hundred thousands, five thousand dollars cash on hand. You have cash sales during May of, of ten thousand. Plus, you receive another ten thousand from um, sales that you had in an earlier uh, month or months. And uh, and let's say in this example, you borrow five thousand dollars of debt, maybe on a line of credit, might be an example. So that's a total of, of between what you started with and what came in in cash in May. Thirty thousand dollars that you now have on hand, but then you have to have cash payments that you pay out. Um, you know, payments for things you need, um, accounts, things that might be accounts payable um, that you borrowed earlier that you have to pay back, and um, debt payments. And so, in this example, you're left at the end of that month with ten thousand dollars cash on hand. So now you say, okay, now what's going to happen in June? Well, you're going to take what you ended up with in May. That becomes your starting figure in June. Go right through the same process again, and you're and you really again you just just try to project out what you what you know with certainty you're going to spend what you know with or expect with certainty you're going to take in, and obviously um, there's variables and things that you don't know about or uh, expect are going to happen, and that that's really where that cushion comes in that you need. You know if if you if you in your projection, you know if one of these numbers is zero. You got a problem because if everything worked exactly as you expect, it's going to. Well, that's fine. Maybe you can live with zero cash at one point in time. But you know, usually things don't happen as we expect they're going to, and there's always um, something else happening that uh, throws a wrinkle in things. So that's where that um, that bit of cushion is very important. Um, balance sheet. This is. I'm just going to sort of. Step aside for one second and make a kind of a side comment. The, one of the things that I that I've um, noticed over the years when I've met with with built-in you know, contractors, subcontractors, landscapers, and, and any other business, um, could be any business, is there's uh, you know oftentimes there's not too much knowledge about accounting, even even kind of basic accounting, and it's not um, you know n nobody needs to be a CPA to do this stuff, but you know somebody said. Uh, um, very early in my career, somebody um, who was a very successful businessman, he just made the comment, which was very, it was off the cuff, but it made a lot of sense to me. And he said, you know, accounting is the language of business. And it's, you know, we're all in, in various, various aspects of business and have expertise and specialty in, in sort of what we do. But all businesses have a common language, which is accounting. You know, at the end of the month, end of the year, um, some record keeping that has to take place. And, and you know what I've really noticed over the years is that there are a lot of businesses, um, and it's particularly people there. They're you know they're working from six in the morning till six at night. It's a long day, working hard. You know, accounting. You gotta be kidding me. It's, you know, it's in the shoebox. I give it to the accountant, and that and that's that's okay. It's you know that's reality, and I understand that. But you know, realize that as um, you know as you run your business, the extent to which you can understand and really get your hands around the, the accounting part of it will really help you in your planning and projecting um, in, so that you're really able to be proactive and, and plan as opposed to doing what doing what you do and then at the end of the year kind of turn to the accountant and go, well, so how did I do, you know? Um, which is frankly what a lot of people do. And it's, it, it is understandable, but it's also um, preventable if you um, if you learn a little bit about accounting, whether it's, you know, you could take a, a basic accounting course at the uh, Four C's or something, or whether you grab an accounting book at, at uh, Barnes and Nobles. It's not, uh, again, it's not rocket science, but there's some real, some basics that can, that can help you understand and help you plan um, in your, in your business. Um, so back, you know, the balance sheet, um, most, you know, a lot of people in their business, they pay a lot of attention to their sales and their expenses, and obviously you have to do that. Um, they don't pay as much attention to the balance sheet, which is sort of the, you know, the sports analogy is the, the, uh, the income statement is the box scores and the balance sheet is the standings. You know, it's, it's the standings are okay. So I had my activity and then now at any given point in time, 
what, where do I stand? You know, what do I have for debt? What do I owe? Um, how much equity do I have built up in my business? So um, when it comes now getting back to cash flow, when it comes to the balance sheet, you know, people don't realize that a lot of changes on the balance sheet are um, things that are a big impact on their cash flow. Um, increases in, and decreases in inventory and materials that you have to have on hand um, to the extent that you need to buy them. Obviously, that's a big use of cash. Um, you use them up, and that is a, a source of cash. Accounts receivable, accounts payable. These are all things, items on your balance sheet that you have to get to pay or you receive money from, and as those things change, that's a source and a, and a use of cash. And again, going back to the accounting thing, to the, you know, as you look at your, your company's your business's balance sheet, if you have an understanding of how those changes going forward are going to impact your cash flow and your need for cash, it can really help you in your, in your planning process a lot. Um, and then, you know, debt, debt to work or so-called leverage, um, you know, it's a, that, that's one of the very important measures of, um, of business health and, and depending on what the business is and what the industry is, there's different measures that, are, um, that make sense. But what's very important to understand, and again, this is just, just something that I have observed over the years that not everybody really understands readily, is um, you know, the difference between capital that came from debt that you had to borrow and you're going to have to pay back with interest um, versus um, capital that's in the form of equity that you were able to contribute into the company or that you earned and it came into the company that way. And the big, the big difference being debt has a big cost associated with it in addition to which you have an obligation to pay it back and there's, and there's timing of that and requirements that, you know, that aren't very forgiving when the, you know, the bank says, gee, you know, where's the payment this month? Where's, the, where's equity capital that's the result of what you contributed into the business or that you, um, that you earned and is in your company that way doesn't have that same uh, demand associated with it. So it's, um, it's more forgiving and, um, and becomes really a cushion sort of a, uh, uh, a tank of air to breathe off of in the in the tough times, you know, when when things are uh, are difficult and business is not doing as well. Uh, the equity that's on there is important. So again, just sticking with this balance sheet thing, just for one one more minute here is, um, you know, these you have accounts receivable, let's say of, of a, let's just call that a hundred thousand dollars at the end of year one, um, and at the end of year two, your accounts receivable based on the various fluctuations of your business. Now now your accounts receivable at the end of the year are are 50,000. There could have been all kinds of things going on in between those two points in time as far as uh, collections and so forth, but, but just from year end to year end, you've collected $50,000, so that becomes a $50,000 source of cash for you over the course of that year just from, the, from that change from point to point. Um, likewise with equipment, you know, the equipment line on your balance sheet. Let's say it was 150,000 at the beginning, at the end of the first year, and in the second year, it's it's two hundred thousand. Well, if it jumped by that, that means you have fifty thousand dollars more of equipment, which you had to buy, and so that's an outflow of, of cash. And you know, following the same logic across accounts payable, rise that becomes actually a, a sort. Of getting back to the the Tony Shepley analogy again, if you owe Tony twenty five thousand dollars at the end of year one, and at the end of year two, you owe him seventy five thousand. That's a source of cash to you because it means you've gotten fifty thousand dollars worth of materials and supplies from from Tony um, to use. You could not at, at that point had to pay pay for yet. Um, and again, all kinds of changes happening over the course of the year. But this is just looking at from point to point. Um, same thing with debt and then change in um, in, in uh, equity over the course of the year. Um, okay, so. We talked a little about sort of the, the concept of cash flow and how you how you plan for it, and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Can you go back one page? Oh sure, and, and I'm sorry, and I should have said up front, which I didn't. Is jump in at any time, ask ask questions, please. Back back on the chart. Did you want me to go back here? Yeah, the term debt. I don't understand. It said term debt in the first year is 125. The second year, yeah, that's a minus 75. Right, because if you think about if you if you owe a hundred thousand dollars the end of the first year, yeah, and then at the end of the second year, a year later, you only have, now you only owe twenty five thousand dollars. That means you must have paid down your debt by seventy five, and therefore it's an it's an outflow um, of cash 
during that um, time period. Thank you. Yeah, please jump in with, um, with questions at any time. Um, okay, so practical solutions. You, use other people's money. Now I'm a banker, so I know all about using other people's money, because that's what banks do, frankly. But um, using other people's money is just really a, you know, it's a simple way of saying, be smart about how you use cash. Um, you know, there's lots of sources of, of money if you, if you plan properly in the process. Again, trade creditors and vendors, you know, the, uh, the various suppliers of material that you, that you need in your, um, in your business, certainly. Um, banks or other lenders, a line of credit or other types of uh, loans is other money to use. Um, and some of these have costs associated with them and some don't. You know, typically, as you know, trade, trade creditors aren't you paying within terms. You don't get into financing costs there. Um, banks, obviously, your, your, the interest clock is ticking from, from day one. Um, customers, now that's a, that's, a, that's a big one, and it's an important one. It's also an important one to think about right up front when you're, really, when you're negotiating the job and figuring out the contract and what the terms of that are going to be, um, because to the extent that they pay upfront deposits, uh, make progress payments along the way, huge source of cash that you just don't have to pull out of pocket. Uh, and you get to use, um, in generally speaking, uh, free of charge. Um, you know, partners, whether they be an active partner or a, or a silent partner. And there's, you know, there have been many um, situations that, that I've run into with, with customers over the years that they're, that, you know, their business is going along pretty well. You know, their sales are good. They, you know, fundamentally it's a good operation, but they just didn't, they didn't really have enough capital in the business, either when it got started or due to some um, maybe, you know, temporary downturn at some point. And so all of a sudden, they have a situation where the business is still fundamentally good, but they just, they don't have enough cash. And they may even be in a situation where they're not quite strong enough that, the, that a bank can lend them money. And so, you know, if they don't have it personally to put into the business, um, in some cases, it's it's time to you know talk to a partner, or maybe merge with somebody who's in a similar business, and, and maybe um, you know you have a strength that that uh, that they don't have, and at the same time they have maybe some capital strength that you don't have. That's um, that's an important one to keep uh, in mind. Peter, on that one, uh, what about uh, mixing your personal assets with your business assets? Uh, I know sometimes. You it's, do that. Yeah, but, uh, it's a it's a, you know it's a great question. It, it's um there's nothing there's certainly nothing wrong with doing it. You do generally you know and, I, and I'm not an accountant, but um, you, you do of course want to keep track of when you do it. You know if you put money into the company, you can do that as a loan. And so the company has a loan on its books and has to pay you back, and you should be entitled to interest from that as well. Uh, and in fact, you'll have to because the IRS will make you pay as if you earned it. Um, or you could put it into the company in the form of, of equity, so that it's really just, you know, it's your permanent funding of capital into the company, which, and, and that's certainly something that anybody does when the time, at the time you're starting the company, because you gotta start from something, you generally can't do it all with debt. Um, but there's nothing, nothing wrong with doing it, you just, you do wanna keep track, you know, sort of account for it, so that, um, the end of the year, you know whose whose responsibility it is if, if it's owed from the company back to you or, or vice versa. As as a banker, uh, when you're looking at someone's uh, you know, business plan and you see personal assets pulled from you know maybe a home equity or something like that into the business, and yet you, know, you try to loan for the business, then how do you look at that? You it's actually it, it's actually looked at um, as long as the as long as just a the home equity is a good example because it's very common. Um, as long as the home equity loan can be supported and it's not, you know, somebody's not just pulling down on the home equity line and it, it really isn't, there isn't, isn't a means of paying it back. As long as that's the case and it's supportable, it's really looked at as a positive thing by the bank because the bank just kind of generally focusing on the business and so that's really capital coming into the business. It's, you know, we call it friendly, friendly debt for obvious reasons, it's, you know, you're, you're essentially lending it to yourself. So it doesn't have the same kind of you know hard repayment terms that a bank loan is going to have or some other kinds of debt. 
So it's, it's looked at as a positive, and the other reason it's looked at as a positive is that um, just on a kind of a, a gut level, it's showing that you know you have faith and confidence in your own business that you're asking the bank to lend to, and so it's just a you know, it's just a gut check. It says, oh, okay, you know, the guy's putting his own money into this business at the same time he's asking us to put some money in. You know, from a bank perspective, that that feels good. You know, um, sort of logic. Same same theory as wanting to have somebody have a down a down payment in a piece of property that they're buying. You know, they they really have some some skin in the game, so to speak. Um, does, does that answer the question? Or? Yeah. I, you know, what if I uh, came to it for a business loan to pay back my home equity? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, you know what? Honestly, though, is um. I mean, things like that do happen. We do have situations where, if a business has been going along successfully and it's, you know, and it's it has built up equity and it's very healthy, and it's it's proven that it can can support itself and can support the debt that it needs to take. Yeah, we we do do that in some cases. Somebody says, you know, I put a bunch of money into this business at a certain point in time. It, the business has done what I expected it to do when I put the money in, and now I'd like to pull some of the money back out, you know, to, for whatever. For whatever reason, that's not that's not crazy. I mean, banks do that. Although we like to go on the other one. <laughs> but, um, so uh, you know, obviously the the advantage of um, you know using other people's money in various ways that we've talked about is um, is not having to use as much of your own. The disadvantage is. Um, you know, that when you're using other people's money, whether it's in the form of a loan, whether it's a, you know, a, a trade creditor type situation, obviously there are specific obligations that go along with that. You gotta get it paid back at a certain time, in a certain amount, maybe with interest. And so, um, if, if you have trouble doing that, then that can become, that can become a problem. Seasonality, this is in, you know, we're in the northern, uh, northern climate, so that seasonality is a big, a big issue. Um, you know, try and use seasonality to your um, advantage. Uh, obviously, there's there's some businesses that are very slow around here in the in the winter, and then they get busy in the summer. And in other cases, it's it's vice versa. Um, to the extent that you're able to take take advantage of the seasonality of others in terms of, of buying supplies at a time when it isn't peak demand and they're, and they're most expensive, or whether it's um, the ability to use labor that may be more available and less costly at um, at different times. And again, that takes planning. It's you know, it's easy to say, but if you if you need something in July, you can't say, well, I'll, I'll get it in January to use it now. You can't do that. Um, but if you're able to, to plan ahead in some of these things, you can take advantage. Um, can take advantage of that. Um, the other thing, and this is this is very common, especially here on the Cape, when this you know the summer is a um, for, for any business that's in anything even remotely related to, to tourism. Obviously, the summer's a big influx of cash. And um, banks actually will very often structure um, loans around seasonal cash flow, so that if you know that you um, if you know that you're going to have a big influx of cash, you know, from May through August, um, you know, we will oftentimes if somebody wants us to, we will structure payments so that most of your principal repayments, instead of an equal payment throughout the year, that's principal and interest. Most of your principal payments are all happening in that May through August time period when, when your cash is going to be there, and that's really benefit. It's beneficial to you because you you know that you know your greatest um, payment obligations are going to come when you have the most cash flow available. And frankly, the banks like it for the same reason. They they know that they're not going to be um, you know waiting an extra month in February when you don't have the cash um, if you're able to uh, time it when the cash is available. So it really kind of works works well for everyone. And you can't always do it, but sometimes, um, I would say often, if it's, a, if it's truly seasonal business, um, it works the other way too. I mean, I, I can think of doing, uh, you know, snow plow loans for guys, and you know, we structured it so that, you know, it pays back in the winter. Um, I forget if it snowed that year or not. But, uh, <laughs> um, and this is just kind of a, a general, um, Sort of a banking tip. I think the next few frames here are some just general uh, tips about approaching the bank when it comes to issues of cash flow. Um, you know, if you can if you can establish 
credit with, with a bank when your business is healthy. Um, it's really to your advantage because, you know, it's the old, I'm sure you've heard the old adage that, you know, banks lend money to people, to, will lend money to you when you don't need it. Um, and there's a little bit of truth to that. It's, it's really, you know, you want to deal from a position of strength where your business is doing when it's doing well. And you might say, particularly if you're, if you're somebody who's kind of averse to taking on debt, you know, which isn't a bad thing, but um, you might be very hesitant to, you know, to go out and, and take on a line of credit at a time when you really don't need it. But that's exactly when you ought to do it. As long as you have the discipline to not, you know, you're not going to go run down the Foxwoods with it. I mean, um, that really is the time because that's, you know, the bank looks at the business, says, here's a, here's a healthy business, it's profitable, cash is flowing, they can readily afford to pay this line of credit back. Um, you know, you get, you, you secure the line at that point, and then you have it when you, when you really need it. And that's not to say if you don't have, that if you have some bad years, the bank's not going to be saying, hmm, now wait a minute, do we still want to keep giving you this line of credit? But again, you certainly aren't, you certainly aren't likely to get it when things are really bad and you're, and you're really struggling and you're really not in a position to be able to repay it. Um, and then just kind of that last point is if, you know, if you do get into a situation where y your business is not healthy or your, whether it's business financials or personal financials are not healthy and you do still need to borrow, maybe a situation where you need to, to find somebody to co-borrow with you or for a co-sign, whether that be a partner or a family member, um, not, uh, not uncommon and banks, um, good banks will, uh, We'll do that. What, one thing that, um, and again, this is just uh, just from seeing this a lot, you know, co-borrowers co and guarantors oftentimes don't have any expectation, not that their intentions are, they don't have any expectation of ever actually being asked to have to repay it. They just sort of think they're being, you know, sort of a buddy thing. You know, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go sign up for you. Sure, I'll help you get the loan. And, um, and it does happen quite often uh, that, that, that when the time comes and they're asked to, that they don't always quite step up like you would hope and expect. Um, but so kind of keep that in mind. If you did ever have to ask someone to co-borrow, or if somebody asks you, just keep in mind, it's, it's real. I mean, you're, you're, if you're co-signing or guaranteeing the thing, you're going to be looked at you know, right away as, um, as the go-to guy if the, if the thing can't be paid. Um, this is just some real basics on, uh, you know, on what banks really focus on in terms of um, in terms of approving loans. And this is very, you know, in some ways this is overly simplistic, and yet it's really not because no matter, no matter how big the numbers get, no matter how many zeros there are at the end of them, it's the, it's the same issues again and again and again. And the five things, they call them five C's of credit because someone just came up with them while starting to see. But, you know, first and foremost is, is character. If, somebody's, if somebody has a good track record, and it, um, you know, somebody you know, keeps a good credit report, it, you know, pays their stuff when, when it's due, doesn't overdraw their bank account a lot, um, you know, those, those kinds of things. And especially, um, you, you know, somebody who kind of steps up and keeps working with the bank when times are tough and it's not as easy to do, that's the kind of thing that really, um, really carries a lot of weight. Um, the second thing is, is cash flow, which is what we're talking about, just the ability, your, your business's ability to generate enough cash flow to, to carry the debt that, um, that you're looking to take on, as well as any other debt you, you have. A, a bank is not, you know, if you came in and said, I want to borrow uh, $50,000 for a new truck of some kind, and you know, the bank's not just going to look at the payment on that truck and some specific cash flow that will make that payment and say, okay, that looks good, well, here's the loan. They're going to want to kind of look at the big picture and say, well, you know, what other debts do you have and what's the overall cash flow so that they can know that, um, that it will all work, uh, you know, work comfortably. Uh, collateral, you know, just securing the loan with, um, with something so that, that, so that it could be sold to pay the loan off if the, if the original way that you intend to, to pay it off can't. And I, I mentioned just on the topic of collateral, you know, a lot of people, very, very common that um, somebody will approach the bank you know, want to do a loan. In some cases, they're offering up collateral that's, you know, worth two or three times what the what the loan is, and the bank will still say no, and they and they get frustrated and, and angry about that, which I understand. But the reason they get frustrated is they're thinking, well, how can the bank lose here? There's you know, there's plenty of collateral. Have, nothing can go wrong, and um, and the bank's not incurring any risk. And what they 
what they don't realize is that the bank, for a whole lot of different reasons, but first and foremost, for just a lot of regulatory reasons, is ha the bank has to be able to show um, at all times that the that the loan can be serviced from cash flow. If the bank can't go well. There's this piece of land. There's plenty of value there. We can sell that if we have to. So, you know, that's and I don't just mean internally has to show it. You know, there's a lot of regulatory stuff and you know the FDIC and all that. I won't go into all that, but it, it's um it's not just the ultimate ability to get the loan repaid from selling off the collateral that matters. It's the ability for the loan to be serviced right along the way it was intended to and the way um, it's expected that it's going to. Uh, and the other thing I point to there is, is collateral, uh, uh, the stories I can tell you, of, of things that were secured in some cases even by, by cash collateral in the bank and the bank still wasn't able to actually collect it and pay the loan off for, for all kinds of different reasons, a lot of legal reasons and things. But it's almost never as simple. And, uh, I always say that the, uh, when somebody says it's a no-brainer loan, I say, well, I think I'm going to stay away from that, from that loan if it's a no-brainer. Um, and then the last thing is just sort of uh, conditions. You know, what are the, what are the conditions of the, you know, of the industry that you're in? What are the conditions of the actual conditions of the loan itself, as far as terms and so forth? Um, those were all. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped capital. Capital. Um, again, back to that issue of sort of like a down payment. You know, the, the bank wants to know that if it has debt in the company or in a particular uh, deal, that you know, you as the owner have have some real money in it too, have some real capital into it, um, and that your company has enough capital compared to how much debt that it has. Um, again, back to that issue of you know, debt has to be serviced, has to be paid for, it has um, these real obligations that go with it, and, that, and equity capital that is your money into it, or money that the business has earned, doesn't have those same kind of obligations that you have to meet. So um, a well-capitalized company is, is more lendable. And then, you know, other, other things considered, of course, payment history, if you have loans with a bank, we're going to look at that. Delinquencies, overdraft, um, credit reports, and references. Credit report is becoming more and more uh, important these days. It's uh, banks, I, I'll tell you from, I've been doing this about 20 years, and when we, when, when I started in commercial lending, the, pro, the amount of underwriting that you did on, you know, literally calling up, uh, you know, if you gave me three references of folks that you've done business with, I mean, we're on the phone, we're calling them, we're getting all kinds of detailed information, and that doesn't happen anymore. I won't say it never happens, but it's pretty rare. And it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's labor, it's very labor intensive, it's costly to do it. And, and what banks have, have found is that um, more often than not, when you're talking about a small business, and small business can be a pretty big business, um, that the credit strength of the credit report of the owner or owners of that business is a real, real good predictor of how the business is going to pay its debts, it's going to, it's going to pay bills. So there's, there's more and more reliance these days on, on individuals' credit reports um, when, when banks are making decisions on things. So to the extent that you can keep those clean, you know, you want to do that, you ought to get, get a copy of your credit report. And, oh, I meant to bring that. There's a there's a website that you can go to. Not a it's not a private you know company website. It's a, it's a uh, government. I think it's uh, Department of Commerce maybe um, website that you can go to. And there's a process that you you can get a credit report. Um, your own credit report. I think it's um, called the annual report, something like that. That's that's ringing a bell. Yeah. And and actually you can call you can actually call the, the major credit reporting agencies as well. And they they I believe by law are required to give you once a year, give you your credit report. Um, does, does your business have a credit report and you personally have a credit um, report? It, uh, not really, there's, you know, personally you have a credit report and the only, the only time somebody really doesn't have a credit report is if they don't have, if they haven't been really doing enough uh, borrowing for a record to have been established, but otherwise they have a, businesses you know, there are credit reports on businesses, but they're not, they're really not reliable. You know, there's, there's company, and I'm not, to name names, but, you know, there's a company, you probably all heard of the company, Dun & Bradstreet. They're a company that does um, credit reporting on businesses, and so they're, they're doing like what I was describing, I used to do 20 years ago, they're, they're actually calling creditors, getting um, payment information from them, you know, with the company's consent. 
and so that they can actually compile a report so that if somebody wants to pay them to get a credit report on that company, they can provide it. Um, you know, what we found is that the information, it's usually um, a little dated, for one thing. It's not, it's just not all that reliable. We almost never use it. What if um, I'm about to enter a good sized contract with my a customer and I have a payment schedule laid out? Um, can I get a credit report on that particular person? Um, on the individual, it's pretty tough to do. The, uh, you, if you establish, in order to get a credit report on it, there might be a way to do it on like a one off basis. To be honest, I'm not sure what that is. It, you know, businesses that you know, are in the business of extending credit, they can establish a relationship with a credit reporting agency, you know, they have a contract with them, you know, it's a pay-as-you-go kind of thing, and, um, and they can do that. To do it on a one-time one basis, I'm not aware of how you would do that, honestly. And there's a, there's a quirky thing where the, the uh, credit reporting agencies, like if they, have a, if they have a contract with a bank to provide credit reports, they, they say, you can't provide this credit report to the the customer. So in other words, you know, I get a, a credit report with you, and we're sitting there talking about your credit report, and I go, oh, this is great, this, you know, we're going to do this long, this is a terrific credit report, and you go, oh, can I have a copy of it? No, you can't, because this contract we have, I don't know what the reason is, I don't know if it's a, um, I don't know what it is, but, the, but again, you can in turn call them directly, and they will then provide you a copy of your credit report. Not, not every time you do it, but I mean, most, I think it's once a year. Um, so any any time you uh, apply for credit, if you're denied credit, from what I understand, they have to furnish you with a paper to get in touch with the credit agency, and they have to. There, yeah, they, there is exactly. They'll give you the contact information for exactly how you go about getting that report, and then you can see for yourself. Why? Partic particularly if what? the reason was stuff on your credit report, you go, know, "Yeah, I thought everything was on time." You can get it and see for yourself. Yeah. And the other thing is what I thought you were about to ask, but it makes me reminds me to mention it, is every time you uh, every time you apply for credit, credit card, you know, bank loan, car loan, anything, there's a, uh, an inquiry done on you to the credit reporting agency, and every time that's done, it actually negatively impacts your credit score. So, and the reason, right or wrong, the reason behind that is. Somebody saying, well, anybody who has all these inquiries going on means they must be applying for a whole lot of credit all at once or over a short period of time, and that can't be good. I mean, that's the theory, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But, uh, so just be aware, when you, you know, when you apply for something, um, it does affect your, 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 your credit. And I've seen people with, I've seen people with, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't even believe how many credit cards, all current, paid on time, never missed a beat, they get a lot of credit score because they got so darn many. And, and, and at some point it accumulates and the, it works against them because they have the potential to suddenly tap all those credit cards and be way over their head in debt. It's, it's like a, you know, it's kind of a wacky uh, uh, logic, the way the whole thing works. But uh, just be aware that when you apply for any kind of debt, there's gonna be another item showing up in your credit report. And, um, you know, I don't mean applying for one credit card is gonna kill your credit report, it's, it's not. But, um, if you apply for a lot of stuff, particularly over a short period of time, it will it'll hurt your credit report. What's a good score? What's a bad score? What what like six hundred below six hundred? Are you looking at yeah? A there's problem there's um uh, you know kind of rate um they just changed. I, I think it ranges from like eight fifty or eight seventy five is, is is real high highest, and then you know goes down to I, don't know, I think the lowest I've ever seen is four something. But I mean that's Somebody who's essentially bankrupt is important. So, um, you know, you certainly want to be, you'd certainly like to be over 650, 675. You know, you're down in the low 600s, doesn't mean you can't get credit. What's happening these days is that the lower the credit score, if you can still get a loan, it's more expensive. So, as you know, a real strong score, you know, you're probably going to get the loan and it's going to be a great rate kind of a, a medium score, you'll still get the loan, maybe not quite as great a rate, but okay. The lower the score, if you can still get the loan, the rate's gonna be, is gonna that be is If the bank can get any money together. If the bank can get any money, <laughs> well said. <laughs> um, what else? Uh,
report. Okay, and then communication and financial reporting. Again, in terms of dealing with the bank, very important. Um, you know, banks. Um, banks hate surprises. Number one, and and number two, banks um, because getting back to that sort of that regulatory thing, banks have uh, a lot of. Um, we have a lot of requirements to have on file information so that we can, you know, when I just pick on the FDIC because they, you know, they regulate banks and they, they're doing what they do. You know, when they come in and look through the file, they want to know that we have the information in file to justify the loan that we've made on, a, on an ongoing basis. So it's not just when you initially do it, but it's on commercial loans, not, not so much on consumer loans, but on commercial loans. We have to collect that information, you know, sort of annually, tax returns and updated financial statements and things like that. And you know, frankly, some people are better than others at providing that stuff. And the ones, the ones who communicate frequently, you know, kind of touch base with their bank, let them know what's um, their loan officer, let them know what's going on, provide the financial reporting on a timely basis. It, you know, kind of gets back to that character thing a little bit. Is somewhere in the back of the lender's mind, they're going, oh yeah, this is this is the guy who provides his uh, financial statements before I even ask, or uh, you know, gives me the information that I need, makes it easy for me to just get the loan approved. And, and then there's others who sort of, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get the information, and that doesn't uh, that doesn't help the cause. So those are all uh, things to be aware of. Um, okay, so talking again, talk. This is just getting at the issue of um, of some uh, some things to think about when you're when you're planning your your cash flow and some ways to really take advantage of some things. You know, when you're negotiating a contract, you have to think about when you're going to be laying out cash over the course of the project and the timing of it. Um, you, you know, uh, in the construction world, uh, just thinking of you know residential construction. If you're uh, if you're a general contractor and you're, you know, you got to get the whole dug and you got to get the foundation poured and get the decking on. You, you, you know, right off the bat, you're probably going to pay the excavation guy some kind of deposit to show up. You're going to get a deposit to the to the foundation guy, and, and you're going to pay for some lumber to get the decking on. So, so right away, you're laying out cash, and you know, right up front, you're going to have to do that. So, when you're, you know, doing the contract with the customer, you know, to the extent this is going back to the using other people's money, to the extent possible, you absolutely want to have them paying to you the deposits and sort of progress payments. Um, at as close as possible to the time when you're going to have to lay that cash out throughout the course of the project. Um, uh, you can, you know, you can, you can, assuming you set it up right and it goes the way you expect, uh, you can really minimize your own outlay of cash by doing that. Um, you know, by, by thinking through that process, you can also figure out if you're going to need to borrow money to do that project. You know, if you, if um, either because you know they're paying for things, the customer's paying for things as you go along, or because maybe it's you know maybe they are you know you're doing a you're doing a remodeling job and they're just they're pulling off a home equity line in their house and they're paying for things as you go along. You may not have to lay out much of any out of pocket, um, and that and that's terrific. Um, you know, in some cases like you know we do um, <laughs> not so much now, but um, residential uh, you know construction loans, spec construction loans. Um, we, you know, even if somebody has secured a loan for that project, they, you know, and we've identified that we'll advance as, you know, as work progresses, um, there's oftentimes still an amount of cash that the, that the borrower, the builder, needs to pull out of pocket even to bridge the gap. Because what happens is the, the bank typically will advance on what's done and in place because that really becomes the collateral, it's sort of, you know, we're lending the money on what's been done because that now has been the value that's created that secures the loan. So that's why it has to be in place first. So, um, but if you think about it, if the bank won't advance until it's done, and meanwhile, you gotta get the, again, whether it's the, you know, the deposit for the foundation guy or the decking, uh, you know, material or framing, whatever it is, um, you have to pay that upfront. You're still probably laying some cash out of pocket before the bank will advance on the completed work. So, you know, keep that in mind, um, even even when you have a uh, construction loan. Um, 
yeah, getting you know if the customer will secure a loan, that, that's a terrific way to do it. And, and if you can uh, if you can do that, that that eliminates your need. You know, you don't have to borrow the money; it costs you less. You don't you know you're not sort of leveraging yourself up um, to do it, and that is uh, that's a terrific way to go. And then um, just discounting that last point, you all you know whether you've done it yourself in your own businesses. I'm sure everybody's seen the bill that says you know it's due within 30 days, but if you pay it within 10 days, we'll take two percent off or whatever. And you know sometimes that's a good way to go. It's a, it's a trade-off. You know if you're if you're owed you know, ten thousand dollars and you're going to offer somebody a two percent discount um, if they pay it you know by the end of the week or something, well that, that's good. But that's two hundred bucks you're not going to get. Is it more is it more worthwhile to you to get it quickly and get a little less, or is it okay if you wait a little bit longer and get the, get the full amount? That's something you have to decide. But if it, if getting cash in quickly is is an objective. It's something that's worth um, considering. Uh, oh, and the other thing is, uh, on the other end, when you're paying, when you're paying things, keep, you know, if you do the math on, on, on taking the discount and paying early, um, you can, you'll find that, generally speaking, particularly with something with it, you're doing frequently, you know, you take that discount every time, you know, pay it. You're, you're saving a lot of money, even if you had to do, even if you had a line of credit. Or use your home equity line, and are using that money to pay the discount. What you pay in interest is negligible compared to what you get on the discount. If it's a typical, you know, two, one, two, three percent discount. Uh, so just something to keep in mind here. Uh, custom work versus speculative. You know, and obviously there's a lot less speculative work going on these days. We all know that, but. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if you're doing things on spec, you have to you have to have a lot of equity into the thing because, generally speaking, nobody's going to lend you money. Certainly not a bank unless you have real money into the you know into the game. Um, you're spending a lot of cash on each uh, on each phase of it until the loan is drawn, and um, and then you can also run into lots of overruns and, and and changes that are not expected that cost money. And then if the thing doesn't sell, something we're experiencing now. Uh, you know, now you, now you really have carrying costs. You have a lot of money tied up in it. You, you borrowed some money probably to, to do it, and it's not selling. And now you know the interest is ticking, and you're still having to pay pay the um, you know pay the interest on the thing, and, and God forbid it matures, and you can't get it. You know, it's it's uh, very expensive to do speculative, and, and requires an awful lot of cash. And then custom work again. We just we really just talked about that, but you know generally it's a little little easier um, planning, fewer fewer uncertainties. Uh, a lot of times you have you have deposits coming in from the customer and progress payments. Um, it's much easier to finance custom work because it's it's not speculative. It's all you know. You know, uh, the, from the bank's end, they know where the money's coming from at the end. It's either being you know paid off by a mortgage that's probably already got a commitment in place on it, or um, or somebody's you know, paying cash. And then um, and also with custom work, you know, once the work is done and you get paid, costs go away. Um, whereas speculative, it could potentially be out there for a long time until it then sells. Uh, the money chain. Um, you know, whether you're whether you're a general contractor or subcontractor, you know, there are different things to think about. Um, you know, if you're if you're a general contractor and you have subs that you're paying, you, you certainly want to make sure that they are you know, doing what you're paying them to do. Um, because if the money goes to them, but they're not doing the work, you may have a problem with your customer who you probably collected from and, uh, and, and paid the sub. And you guys go, wait a minute, where's my, where are my kitchen cabinets that I gave you that, that big deposit for? Um, and, and likewise, if you're a subcontractor, you want to make sure that the GC is, that you're working for and with is, you know, is financially sound and can, and can do um, you know, what they're obligated to do. And, you know, and we've all we, we've all heard it. It's it's you know somebody's obligated to pay you based on when you've done what you're supposed to do, and that always happened because sometimes they go, well, I didn't get paid. You know, that he didn't pay me, so I can't pay you. And you go, that wasn't our deal. I, I, I didn't say you pay me when you he pays you. I said you pay me when I'm done. And um, so you just have to you know sort of a not rocket science know who you're dealing with and know that they're financially um, sound and able to meet their obligations. And the issue of retained interest, that's, that's more on, on much larger jobs, but just be aware in some cases, particularly if you're, if you're a part of the you know, early work in a project, foundation work, excavation work, 
um, structural work, there's, there's, you know, retainage is just money that's held back until the project is complete. Because what happens is, if something later on in the project, if at some point later on in the project they determine that, you know, if the, because the foundation wasn't level, now the, you know, now the guys doing the structural work say, hey, this isn't, this doesn't work. Meanwhile, the foundation guy has been paid. He's not going to be coming back, maybe, to fix the to fix the thing. So retainage kind of protects against that, but um, and that's fine. But the problem is, if you're one of the guys who's who that retainage is being held back from, you don't have that cash in hand yet, and you you can have it tied up uh, for quite a while until the project ends. Um, planning, just. Um, you know, the, the more that you can plan, um, the better. And it's sort of the, the number of times that, I, that I've seen somebody think, and with, you know, with all good intentions, and you know, they thought that they had sort of thought everything through and had it, had it all planned out. And I thought they had it all planned out, and I thought I had thought everything through, and you know, the best laid plans and all that. But um, there are, it, it's just important that you know, particularly anything to do with construction, um, you know, building, landscaping, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of different people, you know, permitting required, um, in some cases architects, engineers. It's important to know who's going to do what, you know, when they're going to do it, who's paying it. Um, you know, there, can, there can be an awful lot of misunderstandings and um, just bad information. I, I'll give you one, one anecdotal example of a restaurant that I... Uh, Went to Atlanta every long back for the purchase of it and for some renovation work needed to be done. This was a few years ago, and the restaurant doesn't exist anymore, by the way. But um, the, when the when the borrower went in to um, to buy this restaurant, they they went through it. They had their structural guy go through it. Had everybody come through. He also went to the town and got the you know like the health the health inspector, building inspector, I think electrical inspector. He had them all walk right through it with him because he wanted to know. And he showed them what he was planning to do. And he wanted to know from them you know, what they saw as a problem or what they were going to require, at least at a minimum, for him to do so he didn't have any surprises. And the only, th the only thing that he was told when he, when he went through with these guys is the health guy said, you know, you, you really need to have a uh, better sink. It's an old sink. It's too small. It's in the wrong location. You need this. You need that. He said, great. Terrific. You know, figured out what that was going to cost. He got into the project. Now, granted, he started doing some things that he didn't say he was going to do. That's the first problem. And, and it, at each step, then, when the inspectors came in, well, guess what? It wasn't just the sink anymore. It's, it was, I, you wouldn't even believe me if I told you all the stuff that, that happened. But um, the point is, it's really important that you, you plan as much as possible. You figure out um, you know, who's responsible for what. And, and you, can't, you, know, you build in all the contingencies, the delays, uh, the things that are that are going to go wrong, that are going to come up, that you have to spend money on, that you know you don't you don't know. If you knew, you could you could build them into the budget specifically, but you don't know what they are, so they have to be sort of a general um, contingency type um, you know line item in your budget. And banks always want to see that. And what, you know, if you have a even a very very detailed budget by an experienced contractor that really covers everything. Um, you still want to see a contingency line in there because you just don't know. I mean, stuff. It's. I've done lots and lots of construction, uh, you know, finance, lots of construction work, and I, I'm hard pressed to think of any project that didn't run into some pretty significant, um, you know, overruns and contingencies. Delays. You know, they're just going to happen, and often they're not within your control. You can you can do everything perfect and still wind up with um, delays, and uh, you know, weather. Weather, of course, is a big. Factors. If you're doing something in the winter, especially, you can, you know, you can run into problems that really delay things. And you know, as they say, time is money, so um, you want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, that's kind of that's kind of it. And this is just some general resources. Um, you know, Coastal Community Capital that um, that sponsored this presentation um, can assist you in all kinds of um, planning. Not only not only do they have a, um, a lending function, but they can help you with um, planning cash flow planning, um, putting together a business plan, doing projections, all, all kinds of things. Um, local banker obviously has, um, has knowledge that can, uh, that can help you, your CPA obviously. The SBA, that's the, the U.S. Small Business Administration, they have all kinds of programs, um, you know, uh, 
um, financial projection um, software, um, lo lots of good planning, uh, lots of good planning information. And then that last one, that is a, you know, that's something that you would, they have some free things, but you would ultimately pay for some of that, but it's, it's very sophisticated um, financial planning software. So if you really wanted to get into, you know, budgeting and planning and, and, and be using some nice software to do it, that is a, uh, that's pretty good stuff. Um, I believe that's it. Any, uh, any questions? I know it was, you know, we kind of rambled a bit and touched on a lot of different things, but as I, you know, as I said up front, I, I wanted to kind of hit um, really some practical issues that, I, that I've just seen people run into and have problems with um, as I've dealt with them over the years. And, and uh, so hopefully those things will be uh, helpful to you. Be happy to answer any questions uh, now or later if you want to. You know, get in touch with you, chat afterwards, or get in touch with me. Yeah. I'd like to kind of open up a question. Sure. You guys, uh, I'm finding my receivables are are out longer now. I don't yeah. know if anybody else is getting into the same situation. Uh, fortunate not how would they pay, but they just take longer now. It seems like uh, much longer. Yeah. We're we're, we're seeing um, <coughs> well, you know, in, in the lending business, our receivables are our loan payments, of course, and so we're. We're seeing that um, a lot. We're seeing more more delinquencies, uh, you know, more more frequent delinquencies, and also delinquencies from borrower. You know, you sort of in the lending business, you have a, a portfolio of loans. There's always some customers that struggle, and there's always some customers that are you can usually count on. There's always some customers that are um, kind of good as gold, and you never worry about. Them. And in this in this environment now, you know, the ones who are Good as gold are probably still okay. The ones you can usually count on, you're starting to see some problems with, and the ones who usually struggle are in a lot of trouble. And so there's just kind of this, you know, migration of um, toward that issue of more delinquencies and slower payments. And um, I, I actually uh, just today, in fact, I was looking at. It doesn't matter what the business is, but I was looking at a, um, some financial statements of a company that owns a bunch of different locations. And they have part of their business is they have receivables, and so we, what we look at tracks from year to year, you know, at year end, year end, year end, um, all kinds of information. But one of the things is, well, what do they have outstanding for receivables, and how long, on average, is it taking to collect those receivables? And I'll tell you that the time, the difference in how long it took for them to collect their receivables a year ago versus now, it's it's like now is in some cases double and triple what it was a year ago. So I mean, that's absolutely it's. On the banking side, is there a tool that uh, the bank may offer a, a small business uh, so that debits can occur easy, easier from, from customers? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, there's electronic uh, banking you know, solutions that can do that. Now, usually, if you're, um, if you're in a business where you have a lot of uh, a lot of customers who are paying usually s relatively small amounts of money, and I'll just use the example because it's very common: is, uh, is uh, gyms or health clubs. Okay, they, you know somebody has a monthly amount that's due. That's sort of a, uh, a business that's notorious for people. You know, they might sign up and then they stop coming, they stop paying. Next thing you know, the club's not getting paid. They will they will usually require that somebody be set up on electronic debit. So you, as the customer, have to sign something authorizing them to debit your account on a monthly basis for a set amount, and you can do that. Now, if you're talking about, uh, you know, a few customers who are making over the course of the contract, maybe, you know, a few payments, it's not as practical, you know, because there's costs that go into setting up that kind of arrangement with the bank. Um, you know, there's not a lot of Counting that goes with it, but there's a little, and it's so it's something that's more geared toward um, large volume of transactions, frequent transactions, and then it's cost effective to do it. I'm not sure if that answers. Well, that. in my case, it's uh, property maintenance of, of, of the homes. Oh, okay. And yeah, that's you know, so, uh, so it's recurring. Recurring. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, does it justify me going out and, and paying a fee to your bank? to set up something like that. 
I, it's, I don't know, but it becomes a volume thing. I mean, you'd really have to, you, and it's gonna be similar at all banks, every bank could be a little different, but you really have to just sit down with, you know, with the bank that, you, that you're dealing with and find out, generally speaking, you're probably gonna, going to pay some kind of a monthly cost to have the software that gives you the ability to do it. Then, of course, you're gonna have to make sure that the, your customers are on board with doing that and they'll have to sign something and that gets um, and that gets done, and then there's a generally a per transaction cost. It's usually very very cheap because it's electronic, and you're and really you're doing once the software is all set up to do it, you're really doing most of the work, and so it's very efficient once you're set up to do it. But again, there has to be a certain level of you know activity. of activity yeah. to justify it, because if because if there isn't, it's really not not worth it. Do you be able to sell a receivable service factor? Again. You might be able to sell the receivables to somebody and get the money up front and have to pay for it, of course. Or just come in there. There's lots of companies that do that. But you don't want to do that. No, that, that, no, that, that that's, uh, what are, these are good standing receivables, I'm assuming. But, yeah, yeah, but even still, they still get their pound of flesh. Yeah, there's companies out there called well, factoring companies, and they will, if you have, if you have receivables, in your business, and uh, you know, good receivables that you're hoping, planning, expecting to collect, um, they will pay you, you know, cash for those receivables. But they're probably paying you, you know, if you're lucky, 80 cents on the dollar, maybe, maybe less. Then they're collecting the full amount, and they're making a huge profit on that. Assuming it's collected, they're taking some risk too. The receivables might not get collected, then they get, you know, they get zero. But you know, factoring is usually something that businesses will resort to if they're really kind of trouble and they have they have receivables and it's a source of cash for them and they need the cash quickly um, and they can't really afford to wait. It is a, it is a way to get money. What about uh, on the, the credit card issue? Uh, what if I set up a credit card processing? I can get my money up front, but what kind of fees am I paying for something? It's like really, that? yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on credit card um, processing, but it's, I know that the pricing of it is driven by, really it's driven by how electronic it is versus how manual it is. You know, the old, what they call the old knuckle buster, you know, the, that thing. Yeah. If you have to do it that way, it's a very manual process. You gotta phone it in. There's somebody at the other end that's gotta do stuff. Very expensive. You're probably paying, I don't know, I bet they're getting, I bet they're getting 4% or more now for those, I'm guessing. Um, if you're, if you're th fully electronic and you're swiping the card and everything's just happening electronically, um, I don't know. If, if it's a high volume, you might be down to one percent or something. Again, I'm not. I doubt that anymore. Maybe, what, the one percent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. It, yeah. it may have gone up now. Maybe the people can, that you're using it can give you the credit card. It could be automated, so it gets taken well, out. Well, that's another. Yeah. If they, that's true. If they agree to it, yeah. then it can be debited. It would really probably be a debit card more so than a credit card. I'm not sure if the credit card could be. Uh, be set up, but you you know, um, absolutely. So, so my goal is to, to get my receivables short, you know, to get this, you know, to get it to work. Well, you mean chase the money? <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, well, I guess you don't do this anymore. So the credit card, the credit card issue though, is pretty. Uh, it can't be done online. Yeah, with a, like yes, a yes, yeah, yeah, it can. Yeah. yeah, but you, you have can if you subscribe to something like QuickBooks, they actually carry the credit cards right through QuickBooks. Um, I had one years ago, through right through CCB and T when it was there, mm -hmm. and we had a we scan in our office. They email our credit. We do a lot of off cake people. They just give us their credit card number. We just put it right through. Type it in, put it through. It took three days two and a half to three days to get the uh, money in your account, but um, then last year it started not wanting to do that. Last year it started to get really crazy because they would start charging you uh, depending on which card it was, like Discover would whack you 4% on, s on certain cards. It, it, you didn't know what it was actually going to cost you until you got it taken out. Plus it costs $20 a month just to have the terminal, which is not that bad because, you know, you can run $10,000 through it. We run whole editions 
right through the credit card. Sure. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely an option. But you got to figure in that two or three percent because if you're running ten thousand dollars at two percent, you're you're going to feel that quick. Right. And so that's where that that trade-off issue comes in. Are you is, well, it, is it worth you know paying it to get it quickly, or do you want to get the full amount? Unfortunately, in today's market, you can't that two or three percent might make or break that job. You know, in regards to getting it. Well, it definitely will. Uh, uh, but being able to sleep at night. Knowing you know you've got a hundred, you know ten thousand dollars in receivables that it's overdue or something like that. Right, it's tough. You know, it's like the nice, the nice thing about the credit card, the biggest thing that I found is, especially in deposits, um, once once you put that number in, you know you've got the money. Right. So <laughs> you didn't have to wait to find out if the check actually cleared. There was no clearing of checks. Right. Or, Right. Or it's in the mail, right? And there are, and, you know, and there are issues of they call chargebacks, where you know, you put it on the uh, customer puts it on their card, but then you know they have some complaint, of, or, or they challenge the you know the quality of the work or or the product. They can they can you know, the credit card companies looking for them to make their payment. You know, mm -hmm. they can go, uh -uh, I didn't I didn't get what I was supposed to get, or it's not what. <coughs> then the credit card company, and it almost gets into like a arbitration almost with you and the credit card company. You know, what, what did you do? Did you do what you were supposed to? And goes back and forth. So and that doesn't happen very often. And if you're doing what you're, you know what you're supposed to do, it doesn't happen at all. But, right. um, are your are your payments all monthly like that? Is that the way they work? Uh, no, I got some, uh, but uh, my issue is that my that last payment now tends to be take longer to get. You know, hmm. usually we come in within. A week, two week period, but now it seems to be 30 days or 40, 45 days, you know, and that's where my profit is on, on usually those are times. They, you know. Are they consumers or are they uh, homeowners? No, just regular homeowners. Change your, uh, change your, your, your money set a little so you have less on your last payment. The starters. <laughs> oh, really? Get, get more. Get it up front. Get it in your breakdown. In your breakdown, yeah. just increase your percentage. You yeah, you try to be fair and you know, leave less at the end. Yeah, I know, but but maybe you should get the first, the last payment first. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you get you get that first deposit, but you know. Yeah, but that should be the last. That should actually be the last payment, not the first payment for the deposit. And then they should make the first payment. Like it's like a security deposit yeah. uh, when you rent yeah. the place. Or exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so but nobody else is doing that. Out there. Yeah, there's stuff to change. We're, we're not in the driver's seat now. You, you can't get into like you can't get into areas that your competition isn't using. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People are more, uh, you know, willing to do credit card though these days because you know they get they get the, the miles or whatever they like that. Yeah, they they feel like there's a an interest, <clears> a degree of safety because they there's that protection. They're not actually paying it yet until the bill comes and they make the decision to pay it and they can dispute it with the credit card as opposed to the debiting their account directly. You know, I'm not saying people won't do it, but they're not as quick to say, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll sign this. You can debit my, my checking account. Uh, even though in theory it, uh, it, it works. I mean, it does work, but in, in theory things can also go wrong, too. So. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. Well, thanks very much for coming. Appreciate it. If, um, you know, I think I gave you all, oh, I'll, I'll give you a package in my card. Um, if you have any questions, you know, later, I'd, you know, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to chat and answer any questions you have. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.